So again, welcome now that I'm actually recording. Um, so we first continue the um, uh, where we stopped in the second lecture with the better structures and affordances and then continue with the third lecture regarding CMC theories. So I'm going to go over to the slides from last session. Um, so I want to explain two theories which I think are both do right to our um, to the role that technology plays in organizations and are I think practically applicable. So we start with the debt structuration theory. Um, so if you remember social materiality, broad theory about the interplay between society and technology, the debt structuration um, takes that concept of social materiality and applies it to the uh, micro level, specifically to the use of, uh, they call it advanced information technologies, but it's basically the use of information technology within organizations. And they explain how those um, technologies interact with other structures of the organization and uh, in so um, affect the way that people work in the organization, the way that people use that technology. So it's a social material theory on a micro level. Um, so the central premise of um, the theory is, uh, is well, this, what well, is now on the slide. So it's actually, I think it's pretty easy to understand. So they say that technologies constrain and enable human actions by providing social structures and ways of doing things. Um, and those social stress structures are basically the characteristics of a communication technology. Um, and they consist of structural features and the spirit of uh, a technology. I can explain a bit further, of course. Um, the social structures of a technology are what we would call the characteristics of a technology. Um, say what we discussed last week with social media. So social media is always, to a certain extent, many to many. Um, social media um, enables you to uh, provide a network of associations. Those are the structures um, of social media, of the broad category of information technology of social media, and those structures, those are the things we can use, and those affect how we uh, work in organizations. Uh, but it's not only about social media, it's about all um, different communication technologies and IT in general. So every information technology provides certain rules, um, that, well, certain, certain rules that require you to work with them in a certain way. Um, so for example, well, you can take everything, you know, so for example, a keyboard has a bunch of keys and uh, the characteristics of a keyboard is you type in a key, you see it on screen. So that's a characteristic of, of a keyboard. Um, characteristic of a hammer is that you can hammer something in uh, with it. Um, and every technology has certain characteristics. Yeah, and that structuration is micro level because it focuses on a, um, um, because it focuses on organization specifically. So social materiality says, well, there's an interplay between technology and society. So social media affects how we work in organizations, but also affects society as a whole. And society as a whole affects the use of social media. Adaptive structuration takes that and applies it to a, to a really specific level um, and provides a way of studying this within a specific organization. Um, so, and if you look at your mobile phone, you know, your mobile phone like this, this uh, contains a lot of structural features, um, so capabilities of the technology. Um, so, so those are the rules um, that are baked into a certain technology. So a mobile phone has a, has a screen, uh, it has a microphone, um, um, it, it, has, it has all kinds of baked-in settings, what you can do with your telephone. 
and that those are the structural features, the capabilities of the technology. Um, so those are the, the, the rules that are based in the technology and that, you, um, uh, that are fixed. But you also have like, um, the spirit of the technology. And those is basically the general intent with regarding to the values and goals underlying a set of features. Now, that's a bit vague, but that's basically what the designers of the technology or the ones who implement in the organization how they want you to use a certain technology. So the general intent with how you should use a technology. Um, and I always give an example of uh, using my mobile phone. Um, so if you um, buy the new mobile phone and you uh, uh, start your mobile phone for the first time, um, on, I think, virtually all phones, um, you have a, uh, you, you see a thing, what's what you see here at the bottom, a row with buttons, that is fixed. So there's nothing you can do uh, besides maybe hacking your phone, um, but you cannot really change that. So those quick access button, uh, buttons at the bottom of your mobile phone, that is really a structural feature of the technology. So that's baked into the technology and programmed into it. So that's a structural feature. However, if you um, buy a new mobile phone, there are certain, there are certain um, applications that are installed and are, that are accessible in quick access uh, ribbon. Um, so I think oftentimes it's uh, messaging, it's settings, it's uh, the default browser from the phone uh, brand you buy. Um, and that is the spirit of the technology. That is how um, the designers would, li would like you to use the technology. That's kind of clear. So for example, when you think about social media, um, a structural feature, like I said, is the ability to communicate with more than one person at a time for most social media. And the spirit of a certain uh, social media may be that it is mostly used for um, informal uh, quick messages like Snapchat. That would be the spirit um, of Snapchat. Can you can you maybe repeat the spirit of um, the mobile phone? Yeah, well, there is no spirit of a mobile phone. Uh, so because a mobile phone is such a huge, uh, it consists of basically a, a thousands of apps. But the spirit is basically how um, the designers of the technology would like you to use uh, a certain technology. So for example, if you, um, so for the, the ribbon example, so if you buy a new mobile phone, you always see that, the, that, that, that there is a phone icon in the ribbon. Um, but you can, you can replace the phone icon with, with a WhatsApp icon um, or whatever you like. Um, but it's really, um, uh, yeah. it's the designers who, um, who decided that if you buy a new phone, you see the phone icon because they think that you use a mobile phone often to make phone calls. Um, so, so that's the spirit. So it's not a structural feature because you can change it, um, uh, but it is um, a kind of a norm. More examples of spirit of social media. Um, well, social media, again, is a really broad technology. Now there is no, there is no I cannot give you a social media. Um, so, so it kind of it really depends on the type of social uh, of social media you use. But let's use Instagram. Um, yeah, maybe the spirit is something that you can adjust. Yeah. So let's use Instagram. So Instagram has a lot of structural features. So with Instagram, you can um, uh, upload your own photos. You can uh, um, you can post on your uh, reels. You can post on your stories. Um, and um, those are the structural features of Instagram. So um, basically the ability to post reels, stories, um, and photos, uh, and you can comment and like, etc. So those are the really the capabilities of Instagram. So the things that you can do with Instagram. Um, the spirit of Instagram is that 
you use um, Instagram stories for, um, you know, quick fleeting things. So if you're on if you're on vacation and you have a holiday picture that you want to share but not want to be uh, available uh, for a longer time, you use stories. Um, while if you have a really pretty picture of yourself, um, you post it um, because then it remains available for everyone. Um, but those choices that, that you use um, stories differently than a post on social media, that's, that's not baked into the technology. That's not a structural feature. It's not a rule. So that's something that we decided so that we want to use that in that way. Um, you can do it the other way around. You, know, you can post all your drunk pictures as posts on Instagram um, and only the serious pictures as stories. No one is stopping you. Um, you can do that with the technology, um, but you don't because those are the, because that's the spirit of the technology. But then I don't understand how that connects to uh, uh, the spirit meaning that how they want you to use the technology because well because that's the that's the interesting thing so you have those structural features that that kind of are in, that are ways that you have to use it but the spirit is like the um sort of designers have thought about okay we think this is the way that we um, intend um use um so we design it in such a way that um that it is obvious that you use it in such and such manner. Um, so the, the spirit is basically um, the, yeah, the intent that the designers have. And especially in organizations, the spirit is usually that, for example, management implements a social media system like Microsoft Teams with the intent, with the spirit of um, um, using it to communicate across the parties. Um, and that, that would be the intent with which with which um, that social media is uh, installed. I now forgot your question. Is, is this some kind of a, sort of an answer? Yes, yes, it's sort of an answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Let's, let's check the other questions. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this, uh, no, let's see. Is it, maybe is the spirit something that you can adjust then? Yeah, that's the interesting part on the next slides. The spirit is definitely something that you um, um, you are able to um, not use the technology uh, according to the spirit. Um, you know when uh, um, when the telephone was invented. Well, let's use that as another example. Um, so when the telephone was invented and and started to um, uh, to diffuse uh, across the society, the um, well, you all know the structural features of a telephone. You, know, you can call others and have an audio connection, uh, which we, and so you can use it to um, synchronously, synchronously communicate via audio with someone else. So that's the structural feature of a phone. But the intention of a, um, or the spirit of the phone, so the general intent, was that we would use the telephone to. that we would use the telephone to communicate uh, formally. So to make appointments, to, to uh, set appointments uh, with, uh, with um, or between organizations, um, to, to listen to music uh, via the phone. Um, so that was the general intent of the phone once so, um, when we started using the phone. So that was the spirit um, with which the designers created the telephone. But then people found out, well, we can also use the phone for informal conversations. And then that took off. And then the, the original spirit, so the general intent for which the phone was created, um, got a whole new meaning. And the phone was used mostly for informal communication. Um, so the, a telephone has some structural features, but the original spirit of the telephone the, the way that it was designed uh, was for informal, uh, sorry, was for formal communication. And we hijacked uh, that and we turned it into something completely different. Yeah, so the spirit is something that you can adjust. But 
you can also use the structural features in ways that are that they are not intended for. Uh, with capabilities, do you mean affordances? Yes, but I'll get to that um, after this theory. The motivation you have to design of a future like intend to connect people, provide interactive communication. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's it, but it depends on the technology. Yeah. Yeah, so the, so for Instagram indeed the designers intended it as well. So they in so they designed the stories, um, so Instagram stories and for example Snapchat as well in such a way um that it is available for 24 hours and their underlying idea was of course with the 24 hour availability that you could that you can post more um in personal messages because it's gone off 24 hours um so that's a kind of a combination between the structural and, uh, and the structural features it's gone after 24 hours and the spirit so we programmed it in such a way um, to allow for personal communication but the important thing to realize is that we have the freedom to deal with that. So we have the freedom to use those structural features. Um, well, no. So we have a certain degree of flexibility to um, adjust those structural features to uh, what we see fit. Um, and we can decide really to use a technology against uh, its general intent. So, for example, that we use the phone for informal instead of formal communication. So we have the freedom to use to do um, kind of uh, reinvent the spirit um, and redetermine the use of those structural features. Because if we all would suddenly decide to only post formal pictures on our Instagram stories, there's nothing stopping us. There's no structural feature of Instagram that disallows it. Uh, is it like Instagram Spirit was first to post photos and like on his content? Now the Spirit is more changed into buying and selling products. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah you see that, um, and it's a combination of structural features and the Spirit. So you see that Instagram um, um, some developed the intent to make Instagram a more commercial application. So being, a, um, being able to buy products. Um, and then they built in certain structural features in Instagram to make it easier. So the Instagram shopping, you know, that within one click you can buy uh, something. Um, and that's, I think that's, that's an interesting uh, example, I think of um, the whole concept of structuration because um, Instagram has certain structural features. So you can post pictures, um, but you can also, you, you can also um, provide some explanation um, below those pictures. Um, and then people started using that for commercial reasons. So uh, influencers posted photos of themselves um, with uh, in the comments a link to the website where you can buy um, the things they endorsed. Then Instagram uh, observed that, so they saw, ah, well, that's a good idea. And then in the next version of Instagram, they built in the ability to directly buy with Instagram shopping. Um, so that's really an example of structuration. So um, Instagram was not used for commercial purposes uh, or not intended for commercial purposes in the first instance. Then people started using it for commercial purposes. And then um, Instagram adapted uh, Instagram in such a way to make it easier um, to uh, use Instagram for commercial purposes. So that's really an example of structuration, um, like a continuous cycle uh, in which um, you have, you create a technology with certain structural features and with a certain intent, then people use it in a certain way and you, and you adapt it, etc. Yeah, the spirit can change, yeah. Maybe you can repeat that once more. I don't know what that was. Yeah, so we have a certain kind of freedom, flexibility to reinvent the spirit of the technology and to um, um, be flexible with the structural features. So um, um, you have certain technologies can only be used in a certain way. Um, 
So for example, a, st a structural feature of a pen um, is that you can write with it. So that's really a structural feature of a pen. Um, but you do have a certain flexibility in using a pen for, um, uh, for, for, um, for different reasons. You, know, you can use it to poke in your ear, uh, for example. So you have more flexibility to counter the spirit, um, but you have also a degree of flexibility in using the structural features in such a way um, that you see fit. Um, so these structural features and the general intent of the technology, the spirit, um, provides a certain structure in an organization. So for example, if an organization installs um, you know, Microsoft Teams um, in an organization, um, th and that provides a lot of structural features. So you can use it to video conference, uh, you can use it to create groups um, for many-to-many uh, -many interaction within a certain group, et cetera. Um, and management can, um, Know, implement teams in an organization with a certain spirit, so with a general intent that you have to use it for well, certain goals. Um, but then the technology starts to be actually used in an organization. Um, and then the technology kind of interacts with characteristics of the organization, with the tasks that people have to do, with the organization itself, you know, the organization structure, the culture. Um, uh, and, and, and with, with well, people working in small groups. Um, and then the technology can still be used in such a way that was not intended, or maybe the technology is exactly used as intended. Um, so I was given an example of timesheets. I, I don't know if you worked in an organization where you have to keep timesheet of what you're working on. Um, so I did, and when I worked at a, was a, um, a research organization, and we worked on different projects, and at the end of every week, we had to keep uh, a timesheet. So we had to list how many hours each, work, each week we worked on which project. Um, and if we didn't do that by Friday afternoon, then we could not log into our computers on Monday before we actually filled in a timesheet. Um, so it really was a, it provided a huge formal structure, um, which was difficult to, um, well, well, difficult to circumvent and to use in another way. So the timesheet is really a technology with a very strong structural, very strong structural features and with a very present spirit. So a, uh, a very pushed intent to use it in a certain way. Um, but still, if you asked around how people actually use that timesheet, um, they use it very differently than intended. So officially, you have to use the timesheet and you have to keep track of what you're doing every uh, uh, hour of the week and then uh, make notes and then at the end of the week, enter that in the timesheet. But people actually use timesheets the other way around. Um, so at the end of the week, you know, you have to, Imagine it's Friday afternoon, it's 5.30, you want to go out and have a drink uh, with your colleagues, but you still have to fill in the timesheet. So what you do, um, and of course you making notes of how many hours you spend on a certain project, nobody does that. Um, so what you do at the end of the week is you just check the timesheets to, to see um, which projects have hours left and you just book um, whatever, is most convenient. So you see, oh, on project number 27, uh, this week we have um, 20 hours. So I just fill in 20 hours. Um, and that's how many people use timesheets. Um, so they use it the other way around. So even with a very fixed technology, which you would say, for, well, it's a timesheet, you have to fill in the hours you worked. Even there, people have a lot of freedom to use a technology in a certain way. And you can imagine that with more flexible technologies, such as social media, they, they have a lot of different uses, that 
it becomes increasingly difficult to exactly predict um, how they will be used in organizations. How is a timesheet something that social structures depend on? I'm not sure if I understand your uh, questions. Question. So a timesheet is is so, so the the way we use a timesheet is not only technology based. So it's really strongly based in the technology that we have to use a timesheet in a certain way, but still we as people in the organization are flexible in the way we use that timesheet and we use it in a different way than was intended. So it's the social structures of the organization um, that affect the use of a timesheet. Is that, is that, does that answer your question? So you can imagine that in a, in a, in a more formal organization, that for example, in a financial company, the timesheet would be used as intended. But in my organization, which was way more informal, people used it in a different way. So it's the social structure of the organization that determines the use of the technology. Ah, great, thanks. So all these factors of the organization, the task, the environment, so the structure, the culture of the organization, uh, the people in the organization, the teams they work in, affect um, the use of the technology. Um, and the, the way that people are flexible in um, using a technology um, and the way that we adapt a technology um, to our needs in an organization, that is called appropriation of technology. So an appropriation is the way that we decide in an organization to actually use the technology. Um, so and I always think this um, cartoon here is a, a very relevant example. Um, so if most of you send me an email, it's really a, a pretty formal email. So it's uh, you miss out a uh, question and then regards, or cheers and name. Um, but if I reply, I reply with yes, no, okay. Um, so the way that I reply to email is much more informal. Um, uh, so the way that I reply to email is much more informal than the way you um, reply to email. Um, and that cannot be explained by the structural features of email. So the structural features and the spirit of email is the same. So it's, it's, it's email is used in organizations for more formal communication. Um, but um, um, different parts of the organization in this case um, appropriate the email uh, in different ways. So um, for me, email is a more informal medium, especially when I email uh, to students. Um, for you, email is a more formal medium, especially if you email um, your professors. So appropriation means that um, Appropriation is how we um, yeah, appropriate, how we use and reuse the technology um, in our organization or in our team or as individuals. So, so getting back to the uh, relatively simple example of the telephone, uh, telephone was really intended for formal communication. Um, then we, the people, hijacked the telephone um, and we repurposed the telephone for informal communication between, mostly between friends and family. That was the appropriation of the telephone. So the, we appropriated the telephone for informal communication. But you could call it, I think, reassigned the function or something like that. Um, and we call the whole process of, okay, you have a technology and the technology has certain features. Um, yeah, I'll come to that now. So the technology has certain features um, and the technology has a certain intended way of use. 
but then the technology is implemented in an organization and uh, then people start to actually use the technology and then the, and then um, in the end the technology is used in a certain way that is not necessarily strictly related to how it was intended um, that whole process of the capabilities of the technology the structural features um, and then implementing it to an organization then appropriating the technology that whole process is called um, structuration of technology um, so appropriation is the part where we um, um, redefine the way we use the technology um, and structuration is really the whole um, uh, the whole process the whole theory so why is this even remotely relevant for social media? Well, it is relevant um, because it um, allows you to think about the interplay. Let me do this one first. It allows you to think of the interplay between social media and um, organizational characteristics. So if you look at this figure, of course, this is not something that you have to remember by heart for the exam. Yep, George, actually, yes. Um, but if you look at this um, uh, figure that they use in the paper, they say, from, well, um, if you look at the technology, you have, a, you have structural features and spirit of the technology. So for example, here they give an ex as an example uh, on the top left, um, a technology may be restricted. Uh, it may be sophisticated or not. So I don't think there are good characteristics, but let's go back with it. Um, and then they say this, the technology has a certain spirit. So it, ha it, it tries to impose a certain type of leadership um, or decision process on the organization. So that's the technology part. And you can do the same with social media. So um, getting back to, to, uh, to Instagram, it has a bunch of structural features um, and a bunch of preferred ways of using Instagram. Um, but then you have the other characteristics in an organization that is P2 until P6, uh, I think. So you have the, the task that people have to do with the, uh, the system. You have the, the, the group. Um, you have the continuous process in which people use it in a certain way. Then they see that it, that it doesn't really fit their needs and then they use it in a different way, well, et cetera. Um, and that finally will lead to a certain outcome uh, of the use of the technology. Um, and here they create a, a model uh, specifically used for the uh, case study in the organization in the paper. Um, but you can use something similar, um, for example, to explain the use of, um, uh, of, 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 of teams in an organization or the use of, uh, of Twitter for, um, uh, for web carrying organization. Um, so, oh, well, let's use Twitter for web care. So customers are responding to Twitter. Um, Twitter has certain capabilities. You know, what you tweet is public. Um, and Twitter also has a certain uh, spirit. So if someone asks you a question via Twitter, um, it's not okay wait two days until you answer the question. Um, but if someone asks a question to you via Twitter, and if you as an organization, you have to answer it, I think, well, within half an hour or so. Um, that, that is not a rule that is baked in, into the technology. That is really the spirit of Twitter, of, 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 of customer service via Twitter. Um, so the a structural feature of Twitter is that it is uh, persistent and visible for everyone, but the spirit of Twitter is that it requires quick replies if you use it as a uh, uh, customer service tool. Um, but then you have all kinds of aspects of the users within your organization and the people who buy your products. Um, um, the way that you train the people in your organization, and they all, um, in the end, define how you can use Twitter for customer service. So 
For example, um, there are certain organizations that have a, well, a rather negative image. Um, if they start to use Twitter for customer service, they really have a really, really high risk of uh, their Twitter accounts being hijacked by people posting negative comments. Um, but it also depends on your organization. So if you um, don't train your people well, or if you uh, lack um, uh, personnel in your customer care department, then Twitter will be used in a different way because people don't have the ability um, or don't know how to use Twitter. Um, and that is really the process of appropriation. So how can we as an organization use Twitter um, to our advantage? Um, but isn't that more appropriation? And it is expected to reply quickly, not per se intended spirit. Um, uh, <laughs> that's a very good point. So it's, it's, it's often difficult to, to exactly say what the spirit and what the uh, appropriation is. So I, as I remember Twitter, it was, no, not really, I think you're right. So when Twitter started, the general spirit of Twitter was just post quick messages, but it's not, it was not about, it was not about quickly replying. It has kind of grown into that. Yeah. Um, so it was appropriated in that way. But yeah, that's the continuous process between technological change and the way we use technology. So um, technology is used in a certain way, then the makers of the technology, uh, so Twitter finds out that people use it in a certain way, and then they adapt the technology and implement it for implement it differently. So the continuous process between technology and its use is a is never ending. Um, so finally, um, it says so the, the whole structuration process means how we appropriate the technology to our needs. And you can explain differences between use of social media and organizations using this technology. So um, the simple example I gave, I gave, so if in a very formal, uh, for example, financial organization, a timesheet may be exactly used as intended. But if you use a timesheet in a really informal organization, then it is, may not be used as intended. Um, so, if, for example, if you implement social media within your organization um, with the hope that people start communicating um, with each other across um, uh, different teams, that if that happens, that depends on the organization. So if you have a very well-structured organization in which people use uh, or work in uh, fixed teams, then, then um, that structural feature of the organization um, clashes with the um, structural features and the intent of the social media application. And then most likely um, the social media application will not be used as intended. On the other hand, if you install a social media application used to communicate across teams in a very informal communication, with a, a very informal structure uh, and culture, then it is more likely that the technology will be used in the way that it's intended. Um, and that sounds, this, this, this sounds really obvious, um, but it is not implemented that way in organizations. It's, it's most of the time it's implemented only thinking of the structural features and the spirit or the general intent of the technology and then hoping that those structural features will uh, change the organization in such a way um, as, well, as intended. But that's, of course, not what happens. You know, it's an interaction between the technology and the uh, organizational features. And that is because we generally tend to think of technology in fixed characteristics. So social media is informal. Um, social media allows you to communicate across organizational boundaries. So we tend to think of it as fixed characteristics, but you have to think of it as um, 
capabilities and general intent. And I think that is the most important lesson of this theory. Um, finally, faithful and unfaithful, um, that relates to um, how a technology is appropriate. So if a technology is exactly used as intended, then we say the appropriation is faithful. Um, if a technology is completely used differently as intended, then we call that an unfaithful appropriation of technology. So for example, again, the example of the phone, that was an example of an unfaithful um, appropriation of the technology. So we use it completely uh, opposite um, as intended. Was it okay? Then we go, uh, if there are no more questions, then we uh, start with the affordance. Yeah. So there was a question a while ago, are those capabilities the same as affordances? Um, and yes, they are. Um, because if, if you noticed, you may have noticed that I, until now, use things like capabilities, affordances, characteristics, structural features. Um, I, I use them all, um, but actually, I think most it is most useful to talk about affordances. And affordances are a kind of capabilities, but then not really objective capabilities. Um, so the official definition of an affordance is perceptions of an object's materiality. And I, I'm not sure if that is really useful. Um, so it's by end, then a bit further, it's possibilities for enabling and possibly constraining human interaction, uh, human action. So, um, so it's a difficult definition, but if you look at it, you see that it's not really about the structural features of something, but it's also not only about the perceptions of something, so it's about the perceptions of the object's materiality. Um, so example, um, an often used example is a, a hammer. Um, if you look at a hammer and if you define a hammer strictly in, um, in its um, objective properties, you would say, from, well, uh, there is a, a wooden stick at the end, um, and, and then uh, at the head, there is something made of metal. You can classify the type of metal, you can classify the form, you can classify the weight um, of the hammer. So those are all objective characteristics of a hammer. But that's not useful for the concept of a hammer, because if you only define a hammer in such a way, you will never find out the function. But if you see a hammer, even if you see a hammer for the first time, you know what to do with it. You know what it's intended for. Um, well, well you, you, could have, you could reasonably guess what it's intended for. Um, so um, we think a hammer is kind of an objective um, object, but we have to see and learn and, and we have to kind of appropriate what we can use a hammer for. Um, so an affordance of a technology, so the affordance of a hammer is that you can use it to hammer, and you can use it to hammer a nail in the wall. Um, that is the affordance of the of an, of an hammer, uh, a hammer. Um, so an affordance is kind of in between you know, the purely objective characteristics, you know, classifying a hammer in terms of its weight and form, um, and in between perceptions of a hammer. Um, so it's kind of objective, but also it is intended use. You use a hammer to hammer. Um, well, the appropriation is, is the way you use the hammer. So, um, I can also look at a hammer and think, oh, well, I will not use the hammer to hammer a nail in the wall, 
but let me use the hammer to bash in someone's head. Um, then I would appropriate the hammer in another way. Um, so an affordance is really a characteristic, a, um, but not really an objective characteristics of, a, um, uh, of an object. Another example, um, let's all use a, Another simple example would be a, a um, well, let me give two. Let me start with a, a rock. So if you would live 30,000 years ago and you would see a rock lying on the ground, you could classify, well, not 30,000 years ago. If you see a rock lying on the ground, you would classify the rock in terms of its objective characteristic. You know, what is it made of? What is the size? What is the shape? Um, what is the weight? all those objective characteristics of the rock. Um, but if you then see the rock and, thinks, and think, oh, well, this rock kind of looks like a, a hammer. I can use the rock to hammer a wooden stick in the ground. Then the rock suddenly has, a, has an affordance of a, um, a hammer. Um, and that's not something you can objectively classify. You know, a physicist or a chemist would never be able to determine only from chemistry that, that, that you can use the rock to hammer a stick in the ground. It's really us that determine that we can use the rock for that. But once we know that, it kind of becomes an objective characteristic of the, uh, of the technology. So once we know that you can use a hammer to drive a nail in the wall, once we know that you can make that, can, that you can use a telephone to make a call, um, once you know that you can use um, LinkedIn to form connections between people, then that becomes a um, a characteristic of that technology, and that is what we call an affordance. So an an, an affordance is not it's it's kind of in between a um, a perception and in between an objective characteristic. Um, so I also always give this example. Um, so this is a, a links to a video, but it's a video of someone who uses an iPad um, as a cutting board, um, which I think you may have never thought of before, but you know, an, an iPad I think is a makes a pretty good cutting board. It's a bit expensive, but you know, it's, a, it's a pretty good cutting board. So, a cutting board, I think, is an affordance of an iPad. Um, and you didn't think so up to now, but now you know it is an affordance. You can choose not to use it that way, but you can. Um, but you have to learn that it can be used in such a way. You know, it's stupid because it's horribly expensive, and you can also use like a wooden cutting board costing two euros. But it, um, if suddenly you know we have the uh, apocalypse and uh, there is no electricity anymore, maybe we start to use I iPads as cutting boards. So suddenly that becomes an affordance, and then we lose all the other characteristics of an iPad, and we can only use it for that. So. Um, it's a bit of a silly example, but it shows that an affordance is not, is not, it's not only an objective characteristic. Um, but um, no, it's not. Just, it's not only the subjective use. It's in between. So, for example, if I would give you a pillow, and if I would say this pillow is a cutting board, then you would say no. This pillow cannot be a cutting board. You cannot use a pillow as a cutting board. Um, but if I would say, here is an, a, a broke iPad, you know, use that as a cutting board, you would say, oh, okay, I might as well use that as a cutting board. So it's not a subjective use, um, it's in between the objective and the subjective use. So it's the technology that has to allow you to use it in a certain way, but it's also us who think, ah, oh, well, this technology is best used in that way. So it's not a subjective use because if, if it would be purely subjective, we could also say that a pillow can be used as a cutting board and a cutting board can be, can be used to sleep on. Um, 
So it's in between subjective and objective. Um, so, um, for example, um, we are, are getting to the uh, affordance after the break. Um, so, for example, one main affordance of social media, of basically every social media application, is that um, what you post on social media is to a certain extent visible to many other people. Um, and many can be people in organization, your project team, or everyone. But an affordance of um, social media is that it is to a certain extent uh, visible. I think that is that is obvious. You know, think about every social media you use; it is to a certain extent visible. Um, um, even in Snapchat, you can select everyone, uh, or, uh, or you can select a certain group, or you can post for six seconds. But within those six seconds, it's visible for um, your whole, uh, for, for everyone who follows you or all your friends. So, um, and, and other social media are more visible. So Twitter is just public and visible forever. Um, so, the, so visibility of content is a very important affordance of social media. Um, but it's not so visibility of social media. It, it's not. It's not objective. You you cannot say for oh, well it, it has like it has fifty visibility or something like that. So it's it's not it's not really objective characteristics as well. It's just um, a characteristics. Sorry. Um, so visibility of social media is a characteristic that we have um, decided. Uh, it's that is a characteristic because it's. It's obvious when you look at the technology. So the concept is quite of affordance is quite difficult, um, but the best way I think to remember is that it is in between. Um, um, that it is in between objective and subjective use. So it's kind of. Um, Um, so an affordance is uh, basically who gave the example Saskia. So I think defining it in terms of appropriation, I think it's it's it, it, it I think that's really a, a good idea. So an affordance of a technology is a characteristic of a technology after appropriation. So we started using social media, um, and then now we see that. And uh, we have used social media in certain ways. And now we see that visibility of social media is a very important characteristic. Um, so we learned that it is a very important characteristic. So that really is an affordance. So I think that, that it that really helps definition. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. So affordances are kind of functional so they so they are a part of the technology you use so social media is always visible um, but they are also relational so you have to learn that you can use the technology in a certain way um, and depending on who you learn it from um, the technology can be used in a certain way so um, if you look at the functionality and relation and relational aspects of an affordance, using an iPad as a cutting board, um, it, it is a functional characteristic because an, an iPad has kind of the same dimensions and as a, a cutting board. Um, but you have to learn that you can use it that way from someone else. Um, so an affordance is both functional, related to the technology, and relational, related to, um, again, how we appropriate the technology. Um, let me do uh, uh, one more slide, and then we have a break. Um, so that means affordances are also contextual. Um, so if I would show um, 
you know, if I would show my phone to someone in the US, that person in the US would immediately understand that it, that it is a phone. Um, if I would give my uh, mobile phone to, um, you know, to a, a, a tribe with very little contact with the outside world in Papua New Guinea, um, they would have no idea what to do with the phone. Well, probably now they, they do. Um, you can imagine that someone who has never encountered the phone needs to learn it. Um, so they are contextual as well. And that also really ties in with adaptive structuration. So what we think we can use certain social media for really depends on the social, cultural, and economic context. And this also really depends on the organization um, that a certain social media is used in. Um, so the concept, context provides concepts and rules that affects how affordances are perceived and used. And I think, and then we really go uh, to the break. Um, there are a lot of videos on YouTube um, of babies who, um, for the first time, see a magazine, you know, a, an old fashioned paper magazine, and who do not understand the concept of a magazine. So you see those babies like doing this. Um, on the images in the, they see in the magazine. Um, because those babies, they, they, they have encountered an iPad and they can swipe, they, they have learned that they can swipe an iPad and they see another image, but they have not learned that a, a magazine cannot do that. Um, so you see them trying to swipe a magazine. And I think that's a, that's a very good example of an affordance. So they, they have learned the affordance of a technology like a magazine or an iPad, or at least you know images and content on a, on a sort of a screen, the affordance is that it's interactive, that you can swipe it and interact with it. And then suddenly they encounter a technology which doesn't have that affordance. So a magazine cannot easily be interacted with. Um, and then they learn that not all technologies have that affordance and that they actually have to flip the page. Um, but I, you know, probably in 50 years or so, no one will understand what a magazine is and that, 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 that you cannot make it much smaller or bigger. Um, so that is what an affordance is. And then after the break, we go to the main affordances of social media. Um, but let's now have a break of, uh, is that 10 minutes or so? Yeah, let's start at five before, uh, before 10. And then I can see if I can find the video of the baby swiping. Okay, see you in a bit. So welcome back. Um, I'm not sure if you have seen the chat, but then uh, I, I uh, and explain what um, social media is based on a um, question by Salome. Um, so I said um, that the advantage of an affordance is that you can use to think of technology in terms of the most obvious use instead of its you know, objective technical characteristics. So if you think of social media as not a bunch of JavaScript code, but social media is visible. Social media is many to many. Social media is user generated content. I think these are not objective characteristics, and these so these I think are, but but they are kind of objective to social media, or at least they are what we think social media should be used for, um, and therefore they are way more useful to think of how social media is used in organizations. Um, and of course, every technology has has something like. Uh, has, has affordances, but for us, it's mostly important to think about social media and other, also other communication technologies uh, that way. Um, so to summarize, so what affordances does, it really avoids determinism constructivism debate because it acknowledges both perspectives. So we don't say, well, 
social media is really a database with uh, some programming code um, and that really affects um, people in such a way but we say oh well no we kind of decided together that um, visibility and the many-to-many -many characteristics of social media that that is the most important um, those are the most important characteristics of social media um, and, and that is how we define uh, social media and that is how we investigate and try to explain the effects of social media so it, it, it's um, in between both perspectives um, but it's all on, on, it's also not purely constructivistic you know like I said with the, with the pillow as a cutting board example it, it also is really kind of objectively based you know, there are just certain ways you can and cannot use the technology um, so yeah it, it's not it's not a theory on, from, from organization science it's not a theory from technology partners really an interaction uh, between all of them and it's focused on functionality rather than features. So that, that's what I meant with many to many. It's not an objective feature of a technology, but it's the, the, the function of the technology. So the function of social media, so the most important way uh, to use it. Um, so basically, this is um, uh, another approach that's similar to structuration. So if you want to think about how social media is implemented in organizations and how um, it is actually used uh, and what, so what effects social media have, you can think of, uh, of social media in terms of affordances. And oh, weird. Um, so enterprise social media are, um, this is the official definition, but um, if, if you look at the official definition, it's enterprise social media as basically social, what we define as social media, but then uh, used in an organization. So um, you, it allows workers to communicate, um, to explicitly or, uh, indicate, or, uh, sorry, to explicitly indicate or implicitly reveal particular coworkers. Sounds weird, but that basically means that you have a network. Um, you can post, edit, and sort text and files linked to themselves. It basically means user-generated content. And you, you or um, in many applications, everyone else can, um, so they, they stay there, and you can use those files and recreate them and edit them, which is also what you can do with normal social media. You know, you can upload a video on, on YouTube. People can comment and react. Uh, to that, you can react to that as well. Um, on, uh, on Instagram, you have a network of people who follow uh, who follow you. Um, you can post messages, you can reply to that, so you can interact with, uh, with messages and, uh, and, the, and the content, uh, etc. So that's also what people do in organization and social. Um, and if you look at the affordances of social media and also if you remember what we discussed last um, Thursday um, kind of all affordances of social media that we uh, discussed uh, fit in um, this definition only in this paper uh, by Tima Leonardi they have a um, they, they use different terms but I think everything we discussed last week is in um, so so they define um, social media in terms of four different affordances, visibility, associations, editability, and persistence. So it's not the only paper that defines social media in terms of affordances. So you have many others. Some are a bit more technical and define social media more in terms of its uh, um, possibilities for interactivity. Um, others say, for now, we have six affordances or we have 12 or whatever. Um, but I think this paper is the most useful because it, um, it does not come with a list of like 25 different affordances, but it's also not really strict in, uh, in, in the number of affordances they define. So they say social media is visible, it allows for associations, it's editable, and it's persistent. Um, so what do they mean by visible? Well, with visible, they use that, they mean that um, what that 
uh, it, re it re basically relates to the many-to-many -many aspect of uh, social media that we discussed um, Thursday. So that um, what you enter into a system um, is visible to others and usually to many others. So in organizations, it can be visible to your whole project team or to the organization as a whole. Um, for um, social media we use, it can be visible to all of our friends or to everyone. Um, and this visibility in organizations allows for a lot. So it's not only the visibility of messages, but it's, it's, it's also um, you know, creating a kind of a corporate wiki so building uh, upon content, so making um, uh, problems you encounter, making um, uh, chat conversations in which you discuss a certain problem uh, visible. Um, so think of it as um, you, the WhatsApp group you have or the, the chat here for this course. So if you have a question about a certain concept, you ask it here in the chat or you ask it in the WhatsApp group and then someone will probably answer um, and that remains visible. Um, and if you then study for the exam, you can search the WhatsApp group and then reread it. Um, so that's visibility, but it's not only that, it's not only posting content online, but it's also the ability to, to tag uh, the content, uh, to like the content, to, um, um, to, to review it, you know, to give a, like a one to five score. So is this a good product? Um, so uh, reputation management is also uh, based on visibility. So because it's also the visibility of other people's review of certain content. And they say this is um, one major uh, affordance of social media. And I think, um, I think this, is, this is pretty useful, but um, it may also be a bit of a, a, bit of a, a broad um, uh, affordance. So I can imagine that if you have to uh, study the explicit use of a certain type of social media application uh, in an organization, so for example, a, um, a, a review system, um, so think of um, uh, reviews on TripAdvisor, then you would probably be more specific in the types of visibility, then we'll probably define that more in terms of, okay, we have visibility, but we have visibility in terms of uh, comments, we have visibilities in terms of likes, we have visibility in terms of uh, one to five scores, um, etc. But it all hinges upon um, that social media makes people, makes certain content visible to many others. So your work, your communication, um, your activities, et cetera. That's one. Second one is associations. So basically means associations is associations between people, but also between content. Um, and this is of course in one obvious affordance of social media. So social media allows you to have a list of contacts and to create a kind of a personal network. Um, So think LinkedIn, think Instagram, think every social media application. Um, what's interesting is that you know, we used to we, we tend to think of associations as associations between people, so your own network, but it of course can also be associations between other types of content. Um, so um, what you see here on the slide um, uh, in the back is associations between uh, texts. So the ability to, to search and um, tagged. Um, text, um, so you know, um, searching for a video on YouTube is also because there is a there are associations between different YouTube videos. Um, so associations not only relates to associations between people, but also like the algorithms who um, associate um, different types of videos, different types of text uh, to each other. And you can imagine that in organizations that is also really useful. So, you, if, so social media applications that allow you to, you know, if, if you encounter a problem in an organization, you search your own social media database, and then the social media database says, well, well if you search for this, then maybe these and these and these uh, issues that other 
uh, colleagues of you have encountered may be relevant as well. Um, so those type of associations are, I think, uh, also important. So that's two, social media affords or allows associations between people and content. Third one is editability. Um, editability is due to the, um, well, it's an affordance that's, that's due to the, um, to the certain degree of asynchronicity um, of social media. And asynchronicity maybe can be seen and is seen by many others as an other affordance of social media. But asynchronicity means that what you type is not immediately visible to others. So you have some time to reflect uh, in mo most of the time. So even when you type a WhatsApp message, you have time to you know, press delete and then uh, restructure your message and only then send it. Um, and sometimes it's really asynchronous and you can also edit other people's content. So the ability to edit and revise not only your own content, but also other people's content. And for example, commenting on someone else and saying, oh, well, Alex, uh, nice lecture, but you're completely wrong here, um, is, is also um, uh, revising other people's content uh, because it's adding upon the knowledge of someone else. So for example, if I, I now explain what an affordance is, and if you then say, oh, well, I think I have a better definition of affordance, and you um, post that as a message on a discussion forum on Canvas, that is using social media, and that is editability. Because then I um, may say, oh, well, you're absolutely right, so this is a better definition of affordance. And then we kind of build uh, knowledge. And that's really, for organizations, um, and for many users of social media and organizations, that is really the most important thing. So if you look at visibility, editability, uh, associations, and persistence on the next slide, the, for organizations, it's most important that they allow organizations to, to have a kind of a history of all interactions, which makes it possible to, to kind of build knowledge in organizations. And then to get a bit ahead of myself, um, that is really important because we discussed in the previous week that people now are, are less committed to their organization and, and more easily switch jobs than before. So you as an organization really want to keep all that knowledge inside of your organizations and not to um, ha ha have it leave your organization if an employee leaves. And social media really allows or sort of force you to build a kind of a knowledge base. More in that in two actions. So editability is the third one. And finally, persistence uh, is the, the last one. And well, we discussed this last week as well. This is a pretty interesting affordance because this used to be an affordance of every social media application. But now you see that more and more social media applications are kind of playing with this affordance. So some of them, uh, for some of them, it's a really fixed affordance uh, and for others, um, they specifically say, oh, well, you can play with the persistence of your, um, of your message and of your content. You know, things Snapchat and stories. But like I said, usually in organizations, persistence is still a very important importance of social media because, because you want to, you know, yeah, grow content, sustain knowledge over time, and have a robust form of communication. And I think this is a really useful way to think of um, the use of social media in an organization. So if you start working in a company and uh, you have to implement a new social media system for you know, customer interaction or, or within organization interaction, you should not say, oh, oh wait, I think Slack is a, good, uh, is a good application. No, you should go to your managers and you should discuss, okay, what do we want to accomplish with this social media? Uh, do, do we want to focus on um, building associations between all employees in the organization? So do I want to make, use it more project-based or individual-based? 
Uh, do we want to use this as a knowledge base, or is it just more related to communication? Um, um, so you can use these affordances to, to think about, okay, what do we want as an organization, and how will the organization react to all these um, affordances of social media? Um, so that's why I think this is a very useful way of thinking of implementation of social media. And I think I also said it Thursday. So for example, if you have a very hierarchical organization or a very competitive organization, the persistence of social media may be the one thing that hinders successful implementation because people are scared um, um, to, to share content because it remains visible. So I think these affordances really allow you a good way to think of, uh, to think of social media. So now we're not going to answer this because we'll be getting there in a moment. Um, but you can think of the different affordances of social media and think of, okay, how will this affect communication? Um, so if we have a certain social media application, um, how would it affect communication and knowledge share? How would it affect the structure of an organization, uh, et cetera? Ah, Fanny, yeah, very good question. Why does permanence of content belong to persistence and not to visibility? Well, actually, um, Leonardi, as uh, one of the authors of the paper, has written a new paper um, in which he argues that actually visibility is the major affordance of um, social media. And he, even in that paper, classifies uh, permanence of content and visibility, classifies everything um, under visibility. So you're absolutely right that permanence really relates quite strongly to visibility. Um, but I, I, I think it's useful to explicitly state it as an affordance here because um, um, first of all, no, no um, yeah, but because I, well, the, the main reason is that um, uh, to show you that persistence is not um, it's not obvious. Um, so, and I could, can better explain it to take, um, when taking persistence as a uh, separate affordance than not. So because visibility, um, even if you um, post something on Snapchat, it is visible to everyone, but it's not persistent. Um, and you can classify it under visibility and explain that. But I, I think for uh, this course, it's, it's, it's more useful to say, oh, well, content can be visible to everyone but can then be gone. Um, because I think that may be useful in organizations in certain sectors. Okay, so in summary then, um, both structuration and affordance allow you to think about the relationship between social media slash IT and organizations without focusing on specific technologies and without saying use Teams, use Slack, use whatever. Um, affordances set, um, kind of classify social media in terms of certain characteristics that are in between objective and subjective characteristics. And that is useful. A structuration theory then explains how these affordances then interact with the rest of the organization. So persistence, okay, but persistence would only work in, a, um, in an organization where people actually trust each other. Persistence would not work in an, other, in an organization where people distrust each other. Um, so those affordances interact with organizational characteristics and together they influence well, the outcomes. So they influence the connection between people, reputation management, knowledge sharing, commitment, etc. Um, so, yeah, yeah, like you see, I'm running very much behind. So I will, um, so what I will do, and if all that's already decided before this lecture. Um, so next week uh, we have a lecture. Uh, so we had a lecture on knowledge management. Um, and then the week after that, we would have a lecture on uh, virtual teams. But um, the lecture on virtual teams, really is quite similar 
to uh, the lecture on CMC theories. So I can, uh, I, I think I can integrate um, the lecture on CMC theories with the lecture on virtual teams um, and then present that as one lecture and then have the final lecture on knowledge management. So what we do next week, so we start now in the last 15 minutes with, with a short explanation of computer communication. Uh, then next week we'll integrate the theories of virtual teams and the week after that we will uh, discuss uh, knowledge management. So basically we switch uh, lecture four and five. Work. I will also post that on the as well. It doesn't really matter because it's still discussed. Uh, I'll discuss, but it's easier for the uh, for my preparation of the lecture. So that was a lot of theory, but I'm gonna present you even more. Um, so because I want to make a start with the CMC theories. Um, so what we discussed up to now, the theory of social media is, is, is indeed a theory of social media. Computer media communication is really related to social media. Um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not completely social media because you know, the whole persistence and editability stuff is, is, is way more pronounced in social media. And computer media communication is also you know, video conferencing, phone calls, uh, WhatsApp conversations. Um, which may or may not be social media, depending on your definition. But still, theories of computer-made communication have had a huge impact on theories of social media. And if you look at how, at, at how organizations use social media in organizations, it's usually tied in together with computer-made communication. So, um, Organizations implement Slack in an organization and using Slack, you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, with um, your colleagues. And so it's also computer means communication. Social media in general is computer communication. So it's useful to discuss those basic theories of computer means communication also because they have, kind of, they have um, kind of gone through the same evolution as think as uh, thinking about technology and social media. So theories of computer communication started with technological deter determinism. So um, you cannot use a phone for informal communication, for example. Um, and nowadays we have kind of an intermediate idea of computer communication having certain affordances and interacting with the organization. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to learn that since uh, I think that the earliest overview that I have that presents theories of computer media communication is from 1975. Um, and people have been investigated have been investigating computer media communication since um, right after the Second World War. Because even then we had some something called a telex. A teleprompter, no, not the teleprompter, a tele, no, I don't remember the word, but it was basically a, it was basically a WhatsApp conversation, but then you type something on a keyboard, it was sent by telegraph to someone else, and then it was printed out um, on paper. Um, and that was the first chat that was mostly used to, you know, for organizational communication, um, for orders, etc. No, no, way before the facts. Well, maybe, well, the original idea for a fax machine, I think, was from the 1920s, but it really, I think the fax machine started going in the 1970s, 1980s, and the first um, teletype writers, they were called teletype writers, they were from the 1940s or something. We even have a, ah, this is the baby, by the way, that is swiping. Um, I'm not sure if you all saw this in the um, uh, during the break, but this is the baby that is swiping um, the magazine. One year old who is happily and expertly playing with the I iPad, apparently knowing just what to do. Then she tried a real magazine, brick and mortar magazine. She <laughs> she's trying to pinch and move and swipe. You see, pretty fun. The baby sees the magazine as a broken iPad. Um,
it's I think yeah, a teleprinter or something like this. You can type in messages um, and then the messages were sent to someone else. So and they, I think 1933, so well, yeah, even earlier. Um, so, so, so those are the first um, uh, text-based message applications that we had. And ever since then, people have worked on how people in, use computer-mated communication. Um, so there are a lot of theories about computer-mated communication. Um, and we are going to discuss well, basically four. Um, so these three here, social presence, lack of context, use media richness, are basically all social presence theories. Um, and then we discuss site, SIP, and hyperpersonal. We won't discuss these. Um, if you look at all theories of computer-mated communication, they all are based on the idea that face-to-face -face communication is ideal. Um, and they're all based on the idea that if you use a certain computer-mated communication technology that is different from face-to-face -face communication, for example, less synchronous or you have less cues available, and therefore the effects of people communicating via communication are different. Um, you see the theories of social media have gone beyond that because theories of social media say that, that actually with social media, you can do more than face-to-face -face communication because face-to-face -face is never, almost never persistent. Face-to-face um, um, -face is, all, is all also usually somewhat restricted in the many-to-many -many types of interactions you can have. Um, so social media has gone beyond um, CMC theories and they don't know, and they, they do not say that face communication is always the best form of communication, but still all CMC theories say that, well, face-to-face -face is like the benchmark and we compare every computer-made communication technology with face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, no, the other theories in the paper are um, um, are not exam material. The exam, by the way, will be open book, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but um, um, uh, you get a very good overview uh, for all uh, theories of human communication if we only discuss those. So the rest, no. So, well, you can imagine uh, that the way that people started thinking about computer-mated communication um, was basically that computer-mated communication is inferior to face-to-face -face communication. If you ask people, um, um, is face-to-face -face communication the best way of communicating? People always say, um, yes, face-to-face -face communication is the best way of communicating because it's the most rich. Um, pretty interesting because um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm not going next lecture, okay? Um, uh, because uh, Joost and I still have to uh, discuss how exactly we are going to plan the exam. Um, because me maybe we're going to just do it from home, um, but but we have still have to discuss because all examination are in principle on campus so we don't know the rules yet so so next week we'll come come back to you and we'll explain a bit about how the exam works um where was i yeah social presence theory um so this is still what many people think so if uh, for example yeah we make the rules um if so let me ask you um so if you want to break up with someone um do you think that face-to-face -face communication is the best way of doing it? You can say yes or no. Yes, yes, of course, yes. A lot of yes. Well, then let me ask a different question. Have you or someone else 
Um, so have you ever dumped someone or been dumped using uh, WhatsApp or social media? Again, yes or no? Oh, via hives. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> When I was 13, yes, I <laughs> crumble. Not from a series, yes, in high school. So um, for those of you who are from abroad, Hives was what we had in the Netherlands before Facebook. It was really, really popular in from 2004 to 2008, nine, something like that. Yeah, with a oh, with a crumble, what love. Um, but you can you can imagine that people that, that we we use WhatsApp for very intimate communication. So we use WhatsApp for you know to fall in love, to break up with people. We use it to fight with our loved ones. We use it to make up with our loved ones. We use it to have sex or at least cyber sex uh, with our loved ones. So we use WhatsApp, which is really text based communication. We use it for so many types of intimate communication. Um, so I think the fun thing is that when you ask people about their preference um, and about what they think that is, that is the best way of communicating, they say, well, face-to-face -face is way better than uh, face-to-face -face is rich and you, are, you, you can look someone in the eye. But then if you ask about actual use, you generally see that people are really able to use computer-made communication technologies for very rich and intimate interactions. And that's what this theory is about. Uh, no, this theory is about the first thing. So this theory is one of the first ones. And this theory really says, from, well, it is just not possible to um, communicate um, intimate, relational, difficult communication via computer-mediated communication. Because computer-mediated communication is uh, poor, so it is um, um, asynchronous. It has uh, lots of cues missing, so you have no visual cues, so no nonverbal communication, no voice, only text-based um, in those years. So therefore, it, is, it lacks bandwidth, um, and the bandwidth affects the social presence. So because we cannot see someone else, because we have no voice but only text, um, the communication becomes less socially present. So we, we consider the people on the other end of the screen more as, well, not really as people, but more as objects, so basically social presence. Um, so we are not as salient, not as aware that the other people in the interaction are, are real. Um, that is social presence. And therefore, it is, we are unable to use text-based communication for relational and intimate communication, and we can only use it for task-oriented communication. Um, and this really still defines the way we think about computer-made communication to a huge extent. Um, and, and this is still one of the most influential CMC theories. But like I explained in the example I gave, this is not always true. We are very much able to build intimate relationships with um, uh, and, and to communicate intimate uh, messages via um, computer-made communication. Um, and the other theories we'll discuss next week dive into that and they explain why CMC can be used for warm relational communication. So next week, I'm going to explain that tied in with the effects on virtual teams. So we first um, continue a bit with social presence and then we do the other, the other theories. So um, for now, thank you very much. And I think I will see you on, yes, I will see you on Thursday or uh, Friday, most of you on Thursday. So good luck with the assignment. If you have any questions, let us know. And don't remember to hand it in before uh, Wednesday. So thank you very much for now.